Okay, this demo is going to be a little riff on architecture and we're going to add a twist. So you need a couple extra materials. I need a pencil, I'm using an HB. I've got a metal palette knife, Mars black acrylic. Um, let's see, I've got titanium white. And I'm going to do a monochrome here um, to introduce some color temperature with some yellow ochre. And personally, I like the Liquitex Ultra Matte Medium. Any medium will do, even water. Um, and I use a little water just to kind of clean brushes. And you need a couple brushes. I'm using like about a, you know, fingernail size wide one here. And I'm going to bring in a couple of small ones in step two of this whole process. And also some coffee. That's always necessary. Um, to begin with, when you examine doing that new drawing, you don't want to like do a full drawing. You just kind of want to um, lay out your compositional elements. So here, I like to lay out the horizon in architecture just so I have it, and then double check my proportions. You know, I'm roughly going to work on a um, put the horizon at about a third, um, maybe like a little further down than than one third. And then from here, I just want to work on getting the big and medium shapes laid out. So this building in the photo is on the left is a little too far jammed into the left and it, it just kind of feels a little cramped and sort of tangential. So I wanted to bring that in a little more uh, to change that space up. And then, you know, obviously the tower of this, uh, of this needs to get a little bit bigger and um, and kind of dominate the space. It's the major sort of shape that breaks up the 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 horizon and creates a, a nice little triangle. And the photo leans over uh, because you're looking up at it and you get into a little bit of three point perspective, which is fine. And I wanted to include that just a little bit. Um, to make it feel even larger than it is. And then I want to pay attention to the, the overlap of the main part of the cathedral here and make sure that I am getting a little jig jog in the overlap there so that it looks like one's in front of the other. I think that's really important. Um, I may, and I, you know, here I just need to double check the perspective. I have a vanishing point that's slightly off the page, so um, I'm kind of somewhere between one and two point perspective. Um, there's a little bit of two point perspective going on, so I may want to include that because the photo reference is a very large field of vision, larger than you would normally use in landscape. The other interesting thing is that there's a slight negative shape in the photograph, which I want to bump out a little bit bigger so that it becomes an actual part of the painting. And, you know, you don't want to stick too close to your reference because it is just a reference after all. You can make changes, you can do little tweaks. Eventually, you can make big tweaks and big changes so that things get further and further from the reference and become ideas that are more and more out of your head. Um, this photo is taken at eye level, so all of the people, all of their heads are going to be right around the horizon line, give or take, you know, maybe a little above, maybe a little bit below, depending on how tall the people are. Um, but then what's going to change as the line of people goes is their foot will go up and down drastically based on how far they are away and, um, or how close they are. So, you know, people tend to range between five feet and six feet, um, just on an average, so you know that there's going to be some variance, but not a huge amount. And, you know, blocking them in as big groups of people and just simple shapes is kind of the way to go about it for this particular assignment. And I know you can barely see these lines, and that's the way you need to approach an underdrawing. You don't want to really get heavy-handed with the line work because if you do it will be tough to paint over that sometimes especially if you deposit a lot of graphite and then you have to paint white over something um, or if you need to paint transparently so you know the under 
your drawings just to kind of give yourself some notes and some landmark points to hit. And you can make changes to the underdrawing as well. You know, you can get an eraser out and make some modifications um, if you want to. If you're working with something very complex, I think underdrawing is really useful. And for the if this is your first painting of architecture, you'll probably want to keep it simple like this. Um, you know, cityscapes at a distance are nice because they kind of flatten out and become shapes. Um, you know, simple one point perspective hallways or, you know, painting your house or something like that. Those are tend to be uncomplicated situations. But if you're doing like a street scene with a bunch of people and lots of buildings and a crazy skyline and everything, it might get a little bit too complex for a first attempt at architecture. Now, that kind of completes the underdrawing, and I've gone a little bit heavier with it in places um, to kind of emphasize some of the shapes that I want to get. So I'm going to put out a couple little dabs of uh, paint in that medium and uh, begin working. And I like to brush mix when I'm just sketching like this. Some people really like to mix with the palette knife. Um, sometimes I begin mixing with the palette knife and then brush mix after that. It just depends. If you need a purity of color, like if, you're, if your paint's getting muddy, then you use the palette knife. Um, and here I'm just using like three little dabs. This is going to be a monochrome. The uh, Mixing the, the yellow in with the black is going to make a little bit of a green too, which is gives you some like sort of a third color to work with. Um, so here I'm mixing the matte medium in, and I think that's important to do to kind of thin it down. The matte medium will also extend the drying time, so you can work with the acrylic a little bit longer. Um, if you're using gouache, uh, keep a little spray bottle and you can spray the paint down, and then it won't dry out as quickly. Um, so. Yeah, you can see me here using a uh, palette knife for this. So, and then I'm cleaning the palette knife each time because I want these three to kind of be pretty pure, at least to start out with. You know, this monochrome thing is nice because really what it's allowing us to do is just focus on value, shape, and then we're adding one little bit of complexity, we're adding color shift. And if you've been keeping up with the, the painting demos, in, in the object demos, we began to work with more cool color shifts as well. So on top of that, we're going to add a, another concept in our next, um, the next part of this demo. So here, what I want to begin with is just lay out the sky. Sometimes it's good to work back to front. Um, it's also a very large shape, so it's pretty easy when you find a large shape just to want to lay that down. You could go in with pure white, but I would not suggest that. I would suggest mixing a little bit of black and a little bit of yellow into it um, or your other color so that you get a very pale gray that's just slightly darker than, than your white of the primer or the white of the paper in this case. Um, it's still going to be light, it's, but it's not pure light. The convenient thing about this is that it will begin to unify anything else you do because you're using all three of your pigments in it, even if it's only a little bit and barely, and barely um, within the range of perception. So here, I'm not, you don't have to think too hard because you've done the underdrawing, so the shape's kind of defined. So all you have to do is fill that shape in. And it's okay if you go over to the underdrawing a little bit because that's going to give you better edge control. You'll still see the underdrawing, especially if you paint kind of thin or with a lot of medium. Um, the other thing too is this, this first layer takes a little bit more paint, a little more medium, because when you're painting on paper like this, it's also um, like priming at the same time. So it just takes a little more material to, to begin to lay this out. And I'm not really focusing on brush direction or anything. I'm literally just thinking, you know, hey, let's fill this shape out. Um, the underdrawing, I think, is nice because it, it 
you know, you think hard about what the underdrawing, and then here you don't have to think as much. Um, once you're done with this, then the stage, then of course you reevaluate shapes once you get them laid out. But for now, any any initial problems with the shape, you've kind of evaluated and got taken a first stab at. And I just want to be sure that I really do fill in all those shapes. Um, and that I'm not like leaving anything blank, getting all the way out to the edge, making sure that this is a full composition, and keeping the color relatively flat. It's okay if there's a little bit of modulation of the color. That doesn't matter that much. So, yeah, kind of wrapping that up, and I'm just like tweaking, filling anything that looked a little thin. <coughs> And making sure that I got all the way out to that edge. Next I can um, go a couple of different directions. I can fill in the ground, I can fill in the buildings, or I can fill in the sort of people. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is go is to establish the darkest areas. The darkest areas here are like the people and the background buildings. Um, you can see a little bit of, of color in the buildings in the background, but for all practical purposes, if we squint at that photograph, it essentially looks like just a flat, dark area. And that's how we're going to approach it in the first layer. And using a big brush means that I don't get to be very precise with it. And That's, all, that's like a blessing and a curse because um, I can treat the overall big part of the shape um, very bluntly, but then I can't get into the subtleties of making it an interesting shape yet. So um, some painters would go and try to make an interesting shape and then from there develop it further. But um, you know, just getting the value range anchored, I think, is the goal of this segment. And then we can uh, mess with it from there. Um, you know, since we have a dark out, I think the next logical thing is to lay out the people um, and to block in their, re their basic shapes. And when you have a group of people, um, treat them as one thing. So. I can make a big blob that stands for that group of people on the right. I can single out this one guy standing with the, an umbrella over there. Um, and that, then I can kind of separate groups of twos and threes um, with gaps in between them. And they'll create a nice rhythm that's progressing across the canvas as well, um, or the paper in this case. And here I'm treating them like kind of as flat silhouettes not really differentiating much about them. So that flat silhouette might be one, might be two people, they're standing next to each other, you know? But um, what's really going to make them later is we'll come back and put shadows on the ground, and that's going to really ground them. Uh, that grouping of people had a little light area, because there's some light getting on their shirts, and there are a lot of them were wearing light shirts. So I can kind of separate out and kind of like put some dots where their heads are going to be um, and then leave a little gap where they get light on their clothing. Um, that's just one strategy to remind myself. Uh, the next thing is, uh, if I remember correctly, this building is a lot of green marble. And um, so I want to give a, a color and temperature shift to the actual main part of the cathedral. So what I'm doing here is I'm working a middle value because I've done a light and a dark and I need a middle value to kind of establish this. And it should be a warm middle value. Um, and if it's a little bit greenish, that's kind of, that's kind of perfect because it's um, warm, but it's not so warm that it breaks away from the cool um, temperature stuff that we've done so far. You know, by the end of this painting, it's probably going to look, um, or at least the end of this this part of the painting, like the initial stages, it's probably going to look pretty um, 
pretty monochromatic, um, almost like there's no color in it at all. But um, because what we're working on are temperature shifts, we're not working on like big color shifts, um, and we're working relatively low saturation because we're mixing all three colors together all the time. Um, you know, procedurally, I probably should have done this first before the figures at the front. Um, because it kind of makes sense. I just didn't want the dark to dry out before I got a chance to get into the painting. But the convenient thing is I'm painting kind of thin, so I'll be able to see those figures through this initial layer of paint, and I can bring them back later. And I mean, I'm planning on this being like a two to three layer painting, maybe more if we take it all the way to finish. Um, for the purposes of like a, a week's worth of work, um, doing a few of these where you just kind of block everything in and then take it one more layer to kind of do some refinements and get some small shapes in there is about where we want to go. Um, and then I want to treat all of these as flat shapes first and then add, add to it later. So I like that value because it gets a distinct contrast from the sky. If we squint at the photo, we see a big contrast from the sky. If we squint at our painting, we see a big contrast from the sky as well. So um, we have that jump correctly. If you squint at the photo as well, you see that jump from the building, uh, the main building to the dark buildings in the background. And so we've preserved, we've been able to preserve that with this value that we mixed. So squinting and taking overall average values is uh, incredibly important for our purposes. We're also working in silhouette, so we're working in these, in these uh, basic, basic silhouette shapes and um, filling them in with flat value. And what's interesting about this is if you do the silhouette well, uh, everything else is going to kind of fall in line with the silhouette. And as long as you don't break the silhouette <coughs> or pull it apart by using <coughs> value ranges that are too big, you can do almost anything within the silhouette. Um, and you know, because the shape's defined with our underdrawing, our execution is mostly just filling in these areas. So what we're doing uh, with each stage is kind of limiting our decision range down to stuff that's easier to handle. So you know, my decision here is you know, where do I put the edge and what value is this? what color is this. I know where to put the edge because that's kind of already made for me with the underdrawing and then <coughs> the only real decision I have is how to mix that color. I kind of went over the other drawing and I don't like that little bulge that I got so here I'm taking a chance to clean the brush just a little bit and then pull up a little bit of light value and paint that back over. So the edge gets a little tamed and put back into a place that I like a little more. And then I can also just double check while I have this light out and make sure that I've actually filled in the whole sky area. And there are a couple areas that weren't. Found a quick cleaning and we can move on. So the next part is um, we need to mix a cool middle value for the ground. Um, if you squint at it, it's about the same value as the church overall. Um, it might be darker and lighter in different places, but um, we can distinctly see that it's much more of a cool gray and there's not as much warmth in it. You know, there's very little warmth in this photo anyway because it's kind of um, uh, diffused light th coming through a gray sky. It's a lot of cloud cover. So here we just want to be sure that this is a colder, more pure gray. There's very little white in it, or very little yellow ochre in it, if any. And so here we just need to fill in. We can go over the edges of the people because really they're, they're placeholders and they 
you're never going to get very detailed because this is a small painting. You know, the, uh, the point of doing small paintings for this course is that it's forcing you away from getting super detailed like you could do with a drawing and making you think about larger shapes and how they operate. Um, you know, because you're working with a physical medium. And what working small does for you is it forces you to kind of approximate what's going on rather than be overly specific. And that's a good thing. And here I, I know that I can paint over these people as much as I want because I am painting semi-transparently. So I'll, I know that if, if I go over any of these like, groupings of people, I'll, I know where it's going to be because I can see it see through it just a little bit. And I can create this flat shape there that kind of gets the whole composition laid out. Okay, so there, the composition's all laid out at this point. And so I just want to be sure that I've covered every little bit of the paper so that it's all primed. I can see that I've got a very strong silhouette, uh, a good balance of positive and negative shapes. The perspective is basically correct. Um, my lines are headed properly towards the vanishing points. And I want to be sure at this point to clean my brush off if I'm going to take a break. Um, and if I'm going to stop for the day, I want to clean the, clean the brushes, uh, wash them completely, um, and, and scrape the palette and clean the palette off, wipe it down. Be sure that there's nothing nothing left um, on there to mess me up for the next day. You know, not cleaning brushes gets expensive quickly, especially with acrylic. So, um, you know, take the time to do that and, you know, be sure you know your local ordinances about like paint disposal as well. Be sure that if you're not allowed to wash it down the drain, don't wash it down the drain. Thanks for watching and uh, we will pick up with the next one.